It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Friederike Hansen. Um, Friederike is a PhD student at Quebec, um, so she's part of the R&D department of Quebec and she started her PhD in 2019. She's also a made in Tübingen scientist because she uh, successfully did her master's and her bachelor degree here at the University of, of Tübingen in bioinformatics. She will be presenting a talk um, that has to do with portable and reproducible pipelines. And this is something that Cubic strives for and is quite proficient in. So definitely looking forward to your talk, Friederike, and um, the scene is yours. Um, yeah, thank you, Laurence, for the kind introduction. I hope um, everyone can hear me, um, otherwise just shout. Um, so yeah, welcome to my talk on bioinformatics analysis with portable and reproducible pipelines on public data sets. And um, to get started, um, so what are bioinformatics pipelines? So they are ways to chain different tools together and then to automate and streamline certain analysis steps. Um, and they should be reproducible. Um, so that is what we aim for, meaning the same inputs should always um, result in the same output. Um, and for that, we have a few requirements. So for example, all the tools that are used in a pipeline need to be exactly versioned. Um, the runtime in which the pipeline was run needs to be reproducible. So that is what we use containers for. Um, they can basically encapsulate it, such as uh, with Docker or Singularity. Um, and they should be robust and also easy to install because if nobody can run your pipeline and install it, they can also not reproduce your research and we could also not reproduce it. And some, um, there are some specific languages to um, help you do this. So namely um, two examples would be Nextflow and SnakeMake. And at QWIC, we'll rely on um, the NFCore pipelines. Um, so that is a community effort to collect a curated set of analysis pipelines built um, with Nextflow. Um, this framework was published earlier this year. And I'm going to introduce you a bit more to it now. Um, so first of all, it's uh, curated bioinformatics pipelines, and there are quite a few out there um, at, um, at this time. So release there are about 27, and under development there are 14. And the released ones are also being current, um, constantly um, improved, and um, new releases are being made. Um, so each of the releases is validated and stable. So before a pipeline is released, it has to pass um, certain tests on um, small and big test data. And this is also important for reproducibility, as you can later on then check out a certain version of the pipeline that you may run your data on, and you will get the same output again, or other people could, uh, could reproduce it as well. Um, so they are um, extensively documented. So this is an example for the RNA-seq pipeline and each of the plots um, is explained, each of the output files is explained. Um, for some, there's uh, even an explanation about how the plot should look like and if it looks differently, what may have gone wrong doing your analysis or with your data. Um, and additionally, um, all the code is open source, so you can find it all on GitHub. And um, there's uh, Slack available, so that is a chat room um, tool where um, all the users and developers can talk to each other and exchange ideas and get help during development or doing usage of the pipelines. Um, to give you an overview about the types of analysis that NFCore pipelines can cover um, at this point. So this is a word cloud with the GitHub topics, and you can see it's quite broad, but maybe not very readable. So here's a bit more tabular version of this. So for once, there are genomics pipelines, um, so whole genome sequencing or whole exome sequencing, um, copy number variation calling, there's pipelines for virus sequencing, um, also important now for, for COVID analysis, um, there's ancient DNA. There are multiple transcriptomic pipelines for RNA-seq, um, CAGE-seq, um, SLAM-seq, RNA fusion, um, immunoinformatics pipelines. So we've heard a lot about um, um, immunology this morning as well. So there's HLA taping and epitope predictions, a BC, a B cell and a T cell bulk sequencing uh, pipeline and um, MHC um, peptide quantification. Um, there are proteomics pipelines, uh, long reads, uh, metagenomics, as well as epigenomics pipelines covering different areas. And to a lot of these pipelines, um, people at Cubic have actively contributed code to. 
So I highlighted them here. Um, for example, Chris has um, contributed to HLA typing and epitope prediction. Um, Gisela has written the B cell um, magic pipeline. Um, but this there this hi only highlights the people who have contributed code, not just uh, not the pilot pipelines that we have run. For example, we have quite some RNA seq data process with the RNA seq pipeline here. Um, so how is NFCO organized? So it consists of a core team of eight people from different institutes. Um, from Cubic Gisela is um, is the core member, and they um, organize NFCO, organize hackathons. Um, and just um, yeah, keep it together and make decisions also for N of Core. Um, but the other important hub of N of Core is its community. And since um, it's, uh, N of Core was founded in 2017, 2018, it's been growing a lot. So now there are about a thousand Slack users and about 600 code contributors um, that are spread out all over the world. Um, so to get a bit more technical, I already mentioned in the beginning that all the NFCore pipelines are written in NextFlow, um, meaning that they are intrinsically parallelized. So NextFlow is capable of whenever there's new data available and um, compute resources to automatically scale up and run um, tools in parallel where possible. All the pipelines are containerized. Um, so in Singularity or Docker, and they have automated dependency management with Conda. Um, and NextFlow um, natively supports a variety of infrastructures. Um, so these are all the current ones. Um, so they are um, ones that we use here in, in, at Cubic, so such as the Storm Workload Manager, but the NextFlow also supports cloud providers such as AWS or Google Cloud. Um, all the pipelines due to their containerization are also portable. So wherever you can execute NextFlow and then Docker or Singularity or Conda, you can um, run the pipelines immediately. And all of this together gives us portable reproducible analysis pipelines that can be run on any infrastructure. So to move away from pipelines a little bit, because pipelines are only helpful if we also have data to process with, otherwise they are more of a fun programming exercise. Um, so yeah, pipelines need data. And we, of course, have a lot of on-site data. But also, there's a lot of public data that can be explored. And Sven Fillinger mentioned this in his talk quite extensively. Um, and they can the public data can either be explored on its own, or it can also be used to complement on-site data. So they are quite a treasure that we should make use of as best as we can. And so I want to introduce you to a couple of um, the more known publicly available genomics databases. So the EGA, which is currently about 13 petabytes, and it's very fast growing. So in the beginning of the year, we um, um, saw that they only had nine, only had nine petabytes, or the sequence read archive. Um, other databases that may be a bit more related to cancer would be the Genomics Data Commons GDC, um, which was also previously mentioned. Um, and here you can see an overview on all the tissues that they cover currently, all the major primary sites, and the x-axis is in thousands, so they have about 12,000 lung cancer um, cases, for example. Um, another example would be dbGap, so the database for genotypes and phenotypes, which focuses on um, human um, disease tissue samples, but also the proteomics data commons um, repository, which, um, well, as the name suggests, holds proteomics data also from quite a few sites at this point. Um, next to the, the data repositories itself, there are also consortia such as ICGC, um, which um, don't um, hold data themselves, but they give you a nice option to select the data that you want. So they give you an overview on all the primary sites available on the different data types, on the experimental strategies, and then also then point you to where you can go and find and download your data. Um, another example um, would be the Genotype Tissue Expression Project, GTEx, which has um, about 17,000 RNA-seq samples of um, 54 tissues. Um, next to um, these um, um, data providers from uh, mostly from NIH or so, there are also cloud providers that at this point host data. 
Um, and to just give you an overview, so the three biggest cloud provider right now are Amazon, Microsoft, Azure, and Google Cloud. So I'm gonna focus a little bit more on them um, for the next couple of slides. And Amazon is also leading here by far. Um, so each of these uh, cloud providers, they host data as well. And um, here's the share of data that they host. So AWS has um, the vast majority with about 65 data sets and 61 of those are unique. And Microsoft is the smallest um, in this arrangement. And uh, especially when it looks or comes to cancer, um, Amazon has the most um, cancer data sets available. So um, around almost all of the GDC data, for example, is available on AWS as well as some of the ICGC um, or TCGA data. Yeah, so Amazon is currently the largest competitor here in the private market. Next to the um, so industrial cloud solutions, there are also academic cloud providers such as um, the Cancer Genome Collaboratory, which also hosts a subset of data. And similarly to um, Amazon or Google, where you cannot just um, get access to data, but also buy infrastructure to use, um, you can do the same here and um, pay for infrastructure and run on your analysis there as well. Um, yeah, so some um, challenges that we have with these big data sets that I showed you is that the data download from public databases can be a real bottleneck. For example, if you would want to download the entirety of ICGC, it would take around 15 years. Um, and we have limited local resources. So if you want to download the data, we also need to be able to store it somewhere and we would need to be able to compute it here. Um, and cloud providers not just host the data, but they also offer infrastructure. And for, since we have the portable pipelines, we can take them to the cloud directly and also run them on premise. Um, and to just illustrate this a little bit, we can take our containerized NF core pipelines to our local cluster and compute on-site data as well as public data. However, the public data may be very challenging to, um, to download and to, to run here. So instead, we can also take the same portable and a core pipeline to the cloud um, and then access the data there directly. We can request more resources if we need to. And currently, um, Nextflow, so the language that NF core pipelines are based on supports two cloud providers natively, Google Cloud and AWS. So all in all, this um, allows us to bring the workflows to wherever the data is um, because the workflows are much smaller in size. And instead of taking or downloading the data to where we have the workflows, and we can also integrate the results of local computations and cloud computations. So it makes it much easier to um, complement on-site data with public data. Um, so yeah, some of the advantages of cloud computing for us are clearly that we can scale up and down as we need it. So we have virtually unlimited compute capacities, unlimited storage capacities almost, um, and we only pay for what we use at any given point. Um, oftentimes the machines are fairly new that the extra computation is run on, so they are high speed. And in, ideally data is already hosted by a cloud provider. Some disadvantages are that there could be potential security or privacy risks. Um, these are tackled, for example, by some providers offering geographic restrictions. So you can um, ensure, or they ensure you that, for example, the data would not leave Germany by only computing data in Frankfurt in the data center. Um, there's things like client-side encryption. However, even if um, cloud computing would be perfectly safe, there's currently, in, um, the legal landscape is fairly unclear, which is why there would be no on-site private patient data from our side that would be computed in the cloud, but we will only focus on using public data in the cloud. Okay, so with this, I want to come to the second half of my talk, which is um, part of my PhD, is to reanalyze whole genome sequencing data of liver cancer patients. And we um, explored with analyzing it locally here and as well as um, by the cloud provider AWS. So for this, we of course first have to download or somehow access the data. We then had to prepare the data um, to be in the right format. Um, and then we were in the variant calling pipeline and of course Zarek. And last but not least, um, some downstream analysis. 
So to first to the data, so we, um, as I mentioned, we have 54 liver cancer patients. They are part of the study called LIC-US, TCGA. Um, that's whole genome sequencing data um, with short read paired and data. And it's um, sequenced fairly deep. So the normal samples are sequenced at around 38X and the tumor samples about twice as deep, which comes out to around 300 gigabytes per patient data. Um, and then next, um, I want to introduce you to the pipeline that we use, which is called Sarek. So there are two main developers, Maxime and Silva. Um, for Silva, it's of course not a cat, but this is the profile picture that he has right now. Um, and it was published um, January this year, and they are both from um, the National Genomics Infrastructure, um, the National Bioinformatics Infrastructure in Sweden, and also supported by the Children's Tumor Bank and the SciLife Lab there. Um, so yeah, Zarek is a variant calling pipeline and it can handle both germline and somatic samples, but it takes FASTQ files as input. They are then pre-processed based on GATK best practices and then a variant calling is done and there's a selection of many, many tools. So for us, we selected Straka for variant calling and ASCAP for copy number variation annotation and SNPF for the VCF annotation in the end. And then finally, a report is generated with multi-QC that you can see here. So this is um, a way to combine all, um, all um, plots and um, a lot of the result data nicely for all patients together to allow us to quickly get an overview. And this is um, not just generated for Zarek pipelines, but for a lot of the other pipelines I mentioned in the beginning, actually. Yeah, and we also looked at the top 10 genes as reported from ICGC. Um, so here we compared them to, to ours and on the slide you can see our, um, so our results and we are happy that we could report similar results and to ICGC. Uh, for these 10 genes. However, there are small discrepancy which we attribute to the fact that ICGC has used three different pipelines and then did a consensus call on them and annotated them also using different tools. Um, so the biggest challenge for us when we did this is that on premise we have storage requirements and the data we had was big. So the original BAM files itself were already 16 terabytes and also all um, the files, um, the fixed file size would be 72 terabytes from the original BAM files, the converted FASTQ and the result files. And the pipeline itself also generates intermediate files that it needs for computation. And these are around, around about five to 10 times the input file size. So this comes out to something around 250 terabytes then. Um, so this has been quite limiting and is actually the reason as to why we had to split, split the patient computation into batches of a maximum of 10 patients and each batch took approximately six to nine days. Um, additionally, the data download took two weeks, which um, overall resulted in a runtime of approximately two to three months. We then, since this runtime is um, not is a bit too long to do this on a regular basis, also explored how we could do this um, on the cloud. So for this, we selected five liver cancer patients that are already available on AWS. Um, similarly, as whole genome sequencing data, short read paired in data, and um, similar sequencing depth and similar file sizes. So overall, it's very comparable to the to the study we used before. Um, and here we can see that running the pipeline for five patients took around it, one to two days um, on AWS as well as um, here um, locally. Um, running it locally for 10 patients took around three to four days. Um, the big downside has been though that for five patients, we discovered that for each patient, the computation would cost 260 euros. So if we would have reprocessed all the 54 patients in the cloud, it would have come out to something between 14 to 15,000 euros. Um, and so we can greatly improve the runtime. However, this comes with a cost. 
The other thing is, is that we initially hoped the data transfer would not be so time consuming. However, we are very dependent on third party tools here. And this is because while the data is publicly available, it is not um, open in a sense that anyone can download it, but you need to apply for it. And then um, the ICGC, for example, ensures that only registered people who have applied for it and have the proper um, permissions can download it. They provide third party tools through which you have to go to access the data. And um, in our experience, these have not always worked as stably as we would have wished or been as fast as we would have imagined. But um, due to the storage limitations on premise, um, the cloud could still greatly speed up the computation. Um, since we can parallelize to any number of patients in parallel, so we could not just run five patients at once, but we can also run um, theoretically 54 patients at once and then still have the same runtime as for a single patient. Yeah, and we have uh, no, no limitations on storage space there. Yeah, but it's currently too expensive, which brings me to um, the last part here. Um, so we are now trying to optimize Sarek to run this on the cloud more regularly. And as we're doing collaboration, collaboration with Maxime and Gisela. So the idea is, is to reduce costs by first of all, reducing the space requirement that we have for the pipeline, as this has been one of the limiting factors and space um, and storage space also costs money. Um, and by reducing the runtime, um, the shorter the pipeline runs, the shorter the respective machines are up and the fewer um, fewer the costs are. And additionally, um, cloud providers um, have some specific ways on how you can optimize costs. And for now, we're focusing on AWS and we'll um, try to make best use of this to reduce um, costs as much as possible. So to reduce space requirements, we not just wanna parallelize among patients, so having all patients being um, processed in parallel, but also split the respective input for each patient and then process those subsets independently in parallel where possible. So for example, map um, reads in parallel. Also replacing tools with faster versions. Um, for example, the mapper BWMM has recently seen an upgrade to BWMM2, which is much faster and less uh, space consuming. And in addition, within the pipeline, there are many files. And if you remember, the intermediate files took up almost 250 terabytes in the end. Um, so we are trying to use more compressed file formats here as alternatives. And one of them will be the CRAM format, which is a more compressed version of the normal mapping format. And the other thing now is um, to move to the cloud provider and see where we can optimize on cost there. So first of all, we um, will make use, more use of spot instances. So normally you pay a fixed price per machine, but if machines are idle, um, AWS basically auctions them off to a cheaper price. So instead of having them not run at all, um, they will give it to you for a cheaper price so you can run it. The downside here is, is that they can take it back at any time if they need these machines. However, we have seen that most of the time these spot instances work nicely and we can still do the normal processing. And then you can um, save costs up to 60% or so already. We also reduce storage costs. Um, there are multiple ways on how you can specify how the storage is used. Up until now, we only had the option to use um, storage per node. So a lot of the reference files and the data had to be copied to each machine that we were running on. Um, there's FSX for Lustre now that is also Nextflow supported, which allows a shared storage between the compute nodes and reducing the amount of data that has to be copied. Um, and then last but not least, there's EPS, EBS autoscale, so elastic block store autoscale. Initially, we had to specify the amount of storage for each node manually before we triggered the workflow, leading to either of us, um, either that we specified way too less storage and then had to restart the pipeline, but we still had to pay, of course, for the run, um, or way too much um, for each node. And this now allows the nodes to basically request storage as they need it and to then scale up and down whether they need more or less. 
And also there are ways to do automated infrastructure set up, which um, hopefully will lead to a much better machine selection. Um, AWS offers a huge amount of machines and it's very tricky to find the right machine at the right point in time manually and also to do this all before you run the pipeline. So to summarize um, my talk, I talked about NF Core pipelines. They support reproducible um, portable pipelines and analysis. Um, they um, is a variety of pipelines available, so they're useful for a variety of analysis, um, and they can run on different infrastructures. And I also talked about public databases, and then how we can use cloud providers uh, that either uh, that host data as well as use their compute infrastructure. Uh, we can speed up our analysis um, using them. However, data transfer is still not as fast as we like, and costs are currently a limiting factor to do this regularly, which is why we are now working on Cloud Staric to reduce costs. So yeah, if um, you have um, any ideas on how we can uh, run um, projects using public data to maybe enhance your own data or to explore public data more, then contact me or anyone at Cubic. And if you're curious about NF Core and would like to join or take a look at the pipelines, you can go to NF Core slash join um, and join Slack and um, just try it out. Um, yeah, and with that, I want to thank you. And I want to also thank everyone at Cubic, specifically Sven Nansen, who is supervising me, but also Gisela. I'm part of her group. And we also did a lot of work on this specific project together. Um, she, for example, made made it possible that we actually have access to all these public databases. And of course, Sven Filling and Matthias Seibert, who are both from the ITSS team and have been of great help for all the infrastructure related issues we ran into with um, these large computations. So yeah, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for this super interesting talk. So um, if anyone wants to ask any question uh, themselves, feel free to raise your hand. And otherwise, I'm going to start with the questions in the chat. So um, the first question is by Gisela. She's asking, when doing genomics computations in the cloud, like with NF Core pipelines, how does one deal with the reference genome data? Does one need to upload it to the cloud individually? Uh, yeah, so there are multiple options. Um, so first of all, there's reference data available in the cloud. However, um, the cloud providers are sort of subdivided into regions. So there's um, US East or EU West. And with AWS, at least, we see that we can only use data that has to be present and all in the same region. So if the reference data is present for in a core pipelines, we, for example, use iGenomes data um, that is present in, in EU West. We can run it in the US with no problems. However, if we want to run it in a different um, Air, um, availability zone. So in the US, we have to copy it over. Okay, I didn't know about this um, regional limitation. I think it's really interesting. It's um, been quite challenging for us, yeah, actually. You can imagine if you have someone abroad or like on another con continent. Um, um, it, well, it's less much um, of being on another continent, but I can also access from here this certain availability zones. Okay. So I can also from here specify this and say I want to run it there, which sometimes mm -hmm. can make a difference on costs even. Ah. Okay. Um, then the second question is from uh, Shrikant. I'm sorry if I didn't pronounce your name right. Um, she first uh, thanks you for the talk. And then how much percentage compression can be achieved with CRAM format? Is it a specialized format only for genomics? Um, so I'm not entirely sure what CRAM stands for, but it's um, basically um, compresses the BAM format. So that's the um, already compressed SAM format. So the sequence alignment format, even more down by using the reference genome. I'm not entirely sure about the exact percentage of compression with CRAM format. Um, however, I can look it up if you like and let you know after the talk. Okay, perfect. Um, then we have a, questions from, a question from June. Um, what is your opinion on how you balance between pipeline stability, estab established tools, and incorporating potentially newer, newer better tools? Um, so for NF Core, at least the standard is it should be available um, on Conda. And um, 
if a tool is not available there, then you should at least bring it there. So this at least is the, um, then ensures that you can always access it. Um, personally, I think if um, a newer tool is, is great, then it will hopefully be stable at some point, but um, the best tool is not useful if you can never access it and um, download or run it. So um, I think pipeline stability should be a bit more focused than only using the newer better tools or maybe only use them in an experimental fashion. Okay, and in these pipelines, um, let's say we have a set of newer tools, but some people would rather use the older tools. Is there a way to shift between versions uh, of these tools using the NF core pipelines? Uh, well, you can always run with the previous version of the pipeline, right? You don't have to use the newest release, but you can okay, shift cool. back so to an older release. And this is also important for reproducibility at some point, because if you want to rerun an analysis you did a year and a half ago, and there's a new version of the pipeline out, you may not get the same result anymore, but you can still access this old version and run it without problem then. Okay, so if people feel comfortable with one version, they can kind of stick to it. And if yeah. people are like, want the new shiny toy, they can already play yeah. with it. Okay. And there are also lots of pipelines out there where you can um, set it as a command line parameter and say, hey, I want to use this mapper um, and this other downstream tool. And But in the pipeline itself, there are, for example, three mappers available. Okay. Um, next question is from Markus. He's asking, what is the added value in your HCC project working with W with whole genome sequencing, since this is more compared to using smaller data sets? Um, for example, whole exome sequencing, or is your angle primarily technical one, um, which is of course also valid? Oh no. That's a um, long question. It's in the chat if you'd rather read it over, maybe. Yeah, I just read it actually. <laughs> um, so, I mean, for us, um, there, it was um, very much a technical angle, but also there's, um, we are part of the liver cancer SFB and uh, we're working there together in collaborations where um, people were interested in the whole genome sequencing data as well. And for example, for copy number variation annotation, we see that it's much easier to do this on whole genome sequencing data than Whole exome sequencing data. Okay, perfect. Um, and I'd like just to finish up with one of my questions. You mentioned that you passed files from BAM to FASTQ. Um, did mm -hmm. you already at that point start um, making your analysis reproducible? And how did you do that? Um, yes. So initially, we didn't have a pipeline for converting BAM to FASTQs reproducible but out of this project, we also developed a pipeline for this following the NFCore best practice standards. So it's available on the Cubic GitHub repository. It's containerized and versioned. Um, it has dependency management with Conda and you can run it like um, any other Nextflow pipeline now. So you can also reproducibly um, convert these BAM files to FASTQ. Okay, perfect. I think it's really cool that with Nextflow you can um, more and more you just develop tools that go in the di direction of your project and then also make it available to other people and have a community yeah. around that kind of helps you with it. Yeah, we actually have um, found people in Sweden who have faced the same problem and <laughs> collaborated with them on this. <laughs> okay, um, I'd like to close the question session and with that, um, Frederike's talk. And thank you again for your really interesting talk and for the question session as well.